All right, welcome everybody. We're about to get started here in just a few moments. So if you're still out in the fellowship area, come on in. Everybody grab a seat. Everybody watching online, welcome. We're going to be getting started here in just a couple minutes. Uh, Before we do, though, will you join me as we uh, pray for the night's program? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to get together here in person and to be able to uh, just take part in a conversation that uh, is, is very important and it affects our state uh, in a great way. And so we just pray for uh, the conversation tonight between Pastor Tim and our guest, John Cox, uh, that you would be leading that conversation in a way that really equips, informs, and educates people on how they can be involved and what they can do Um, to really help bring in some change in the state of California. Um, We thank you for every single person here tonight, uh, and for everybody watching online, please protect and bless us all. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so um, we are going to be taking an offering now for those of you that are here and for those watching online, if you'd like to and you're willing to uh, help support the cause with our watch, go to rwatchnow.com forward slash donate. And uh, on the website, you'll get more information about upcoming guests and other events and ways that our watch is involved uh, in, uh, in lots of very important cultural issues. Um, so anyways, uh, we have, let's see, next week we have uh, Katie Hopkins is going to be our guest. Next week, Wednesday, April 21st, um, Katie has been our guest here before, and many of you already know who she is, but if not, uh, go to Instagram Look up Katie Hopkins, and uh, she puts out a lot of content, uh, a lot of great videos. You'll find out real quickly what she's all about and what her personality is like. Uh, She never disappoints, uh, entertains, but also um, she's just very firm and bold on uh, some very important topics, and uh, she really helps make a difference for these causes in her own unique way. So um, come check her out or watch online next Wednesday. Also want to remind you to uh, follow on all the social sites. Uh, for our watch and um, subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't already so you can get notified about other upcoming content uh, like our Wednesday night program, Our Watch with Tim Thompson. So uh, like I said, we're about to get started. We're going to show you the introduction video here in just a moment and sit back, relax, and enjoy Our Watch with Tim Thompson. This past year, the radical left with their globalist mindset has burned down our cities, forced businesses to close, and tried to silence our churches. They told us to wear a mask and stay home to save lives, and many Christians remain silent. That is no longer an option. The silent majority will be silent no more, and the sleeping giant has been awakened. We are going to use our voice to take back the media, stop the censorship, and very loudly take back the public square. I'm Tim Thompson, and this is Our Watch. Well, good evening, everybody. Glad to see you all here. Thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, I want to say hello to everybody that is tuned in online. Welcome to Our Watch, and glad you are with us as well. Um, We've got a lot to go through tonight, but I just want to remind you that what we endeavor to do on Wednesday night is to bring good, solid information to you so that way you can be uh, inform voters, you can have a voice in the culture, and we want to know what uh, this book right here, The Inerrant and the Infallible Word of God, has to say about the cultural issues that we are dealing with. Um, there's a lot of those cultural issues. Uh, so tonight we want to talk about uh, the recall effort and what's going on here in the state and um, kind of where we're headed with that. Uh, to join us today is somebody who is going to be running 
for that gubernatorial position. Uh, so if you guys would, please welcome up John Cox. All right, John, thank you for joining us. Great to be with you. Thank all you. All right. Am I all, listen, uh, all set up here? Good. I think so. Can you guys hear him? Everybody hear me okay? Awesome. All right. Um, so we had you out here to this church. Wednesday night's a little different, um, but we want to ask you, uh, first and foremost, where are we at with the, the recall? What's going on? Well, first of all, let me just say thank you all for coming out, and thank you, Tim, for having me here, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you tonight. Uh, we, uh, we now have submitted 2,117,000 signatures. Now, that number is important because the number that required to qualify the recall election is 1,495,000 signatures. If you are a, under the law, if you are able to get 20% more, which is about a million eight, then what they do is a random check of the signatures. So they don't check each signature. Um, now, having said that, the registrar of voters right now is checking signatures in each of the counties. And so they're going to they're gonna be checking them now to make sure that the numbers are a certain number. And so on April 29th, each of the counties' registrars of voters are going to report the actual number of signatures that are reported. They're actually submitted by county, by the way. This is getting the weeds now. Uh, but, uh, and then uh, on May 9th, the Secretary of State then certifies that the number of signatures that's, uh, that's required has been received. Um, then there starts a whole series of deadlines and dates that come up. Uh, believe it or not, they believe uh, they put in a law that says that people who signed have a certain number of days to withdraw their signatures. So you, <laughs> as if, <laughs> as if there's going to be any great outpouring of people that are going to withdraw their signatures. I think 99.999% of the people who signed that petition absolutely want to be rid of this current governor. I right. Think I, right. Uh, but they get, they get that option. So that takes another 45 days or so. And then they have to certify the cost of the election. Uh, just to put this in perspective, by the way, they're spending about $4 million a day on the crazy train to nowhere that nobody is going to ride in the Central Valley. You know about that one, right? Uh, so they're going to estimate that the cost of this election statewide is going to be $80 million, roughly, is the estimate, or about 20 days of the waste of the money that they're spending on that train. Um, so that has to be estimated. Then the state legislature gets 30 days to review that. The whole bottom line of this is that we won't really know the actual date of the recall election until probably the end of August, maybe even early September. And then the lieutenant governor is the one who sets the date, believe it or not. And, uh, you know, we'll get a special prize to anybody who can even name the lieutenant governor. Um, be that as it may, she, it's a woman, she will designate a date that's 60 to 80 days from that point which means that we'll probably be having this election sometime around Thanksgiving, maybe before Thanksgiving. It just depends on what date she sets. And uh, that gives us a good amount of time to have a good debate about what this state is doing and how it's going to correct itself. Because let's face it, we've got a lot of people leaving this state. We've got a lot of people who can't afford to live in this state. We've got a lot of aspects of this state that are literally failing us as we speak. Last August, we had blackouts. We were told we couldn't use our air conditioners. Remember that? In the heat of August, just don't use it at night. Well, I mean, that's when you want to use your air conditioner. Uh, and so we had fires all around the state last September. There were people around the state that were literally gasping for air because smoke was filling 
their, their lungs from these fires. And the governor's response was, we're going to ban the car in 2035. That was his response. Uh, not exactly what you wanted to hear if you've got smoke coming over your house or your fire, you know, is threatening your, your, your future. Um, and uh, there's a whole lot of other issues, you know, the homelessness and housing, and I hope we'll get into a lot of those. But, yeah. you know, this is going to be a great opportunity for voters of this state to really focus. This is going to be the only thing on the ballot. Think about that. In 2021, we can really focus on, on not only the issues, but how we're going to solve those issues. And that's what I'm going to talk about. I, I'm a businessman. I, uh, I started with nothing. My, my, re, my father left when I was a baby. I never saw him again. And I had to make do on my own, and I built a business. Uh, I, I've lived the American dream, and uh, I just want to see this state work for everybody. And, you know, I could, I could sit at home and, you know, watch what's going on, but I can't do that. I'm just not made that way. Uh, I, I need to be involved, and I want to try to do what I can to, to fix this state and to make it uh, worth living in for, for all the people that, that, that deserve it in this state. And, and let me tell you, California is that shining city on a hill that Ronald Reagan talked about, and I want to bring back that, that, that feeling of the Reagan years and, and, and the fact that this, this, this state can lead the nation. Don't you think that's a good idea? Yeah. So um, before we get in, we have a lot of those issues we want to talk about. Yeah, um, yeah. Before we do that, you, you talked about the process, the signatures that were required, stuff like that. Um, I want to bring up, so that way everybody knows about this, uh, Senate Bill 663, oh. which would allow targets of recall campaigns, in other words, people like Gavin Newsom, uh, they would allow them access to a list of recall petition signers and try to persuade them to remove their signatures. Uh, currently, law allows only elected election officials to access their names to validate signatures. So what do you think about this effort? Uh, of course, um, there, there's a whole thing it's, behind it. It's this. an attempted voter intimidation. I mean, that's it, plain and simple. I mean, anybody that reads it otherwise is not really focusing. Uh, you know, this is really a problem. And I've talked to so many business people in this state. I've talked to... So many people uh, in churches who feel intimidated by their government. They, they don't feel like their government works for them. The government works for special interests and lobbyists. And let me tell you, there's a reason for that. The French Laundry Dinner really highlighted it, didn't it? I mean, Mr. Newsom not only broke his own rules to go have dinner at a fancy restaurant where they... They, they somehow drank $12,000 of the wine. I mean, I don't know how that happened. But that dinner was, was to celebrate the birthday of a, of a major lobbyist. And there were lobbyists who were there having that dinner. And, and it wasn't even Newsom's birthday. It was the lobbyist's birthday that they were going to, to celebrate, which tells you how Mr. Newsom really feels. I mean, he works for the lobbyists, let's face it. And, and we live with the consequences. And this effort at, at disclosing the names is only another way that they're trying to game the system after the fact to intimidate us and uh, make us afraid. And uh, I, don't, I don't think that's the way government should work. Government should be there to preserve our freedoms and protect us and leave us alone as much as possible. Amen. That's, you know, the thing is, we know biblically what the, the government's supposed to be there for, uh, and they've been overreaching oh. every step of the way. No question. Um, Governor, current Governor Newsom says that uh, they're planning by June to be reopened, getting kids back into school uh, and fully reopened by, by that point in right. time. Um, what, what do you think of his predictions on that? Uh, first of all, it's way, way overdue. Uh, I have nephews that live in Orlando, Florida, and if you really want to, this is just a very interesting time with this pandemic because we get to see the difference in leadership. You know, you don't always get to see that, do you? You know, you, you live in a state and you say, well, my governor might be different than this governor, and they do a little bit, you know, differently. 
But here, we can see the results, Florida's results, which by the way, Florida has a much older population. I used to live there 20 years ago, and Florida's population is pretty darn old. Uh, and I, they, they call it God's waiting room. I don't know if you've uh, ever heard that. Uh, but, but, you know, but that's fine. You know, I mean, uh, frankly, uh, I, I know a lot of people that live there that retired there, right? It, it, it's a nice place to retire because there's no income tax. Isn't that wonderful, right? Uh, wouldn't, wouldn't that be great in California? We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But, but with an older population, their death rate per 100,000 is almost exactly the same as California. And their case rate per 100,000 is almost the same. It's not exactly the same, but it's pretty darn close, okay? But they've been open. Their kids have been going to school. My nephews in Orlando have been going to school full-time in, in school since last summer. Disney World's been open since July, Disneyland is still closed. Restaurants have been open all the way along. Businesses haven't been crushed like they have here in California. So we are, you know, getting a bird's eye view of what there is in terms of a difference in leadership. I mean, and it is stark. So the answer to your question, Tim, is that I would have never shut the state down like Gavin Newsom has. I would have protected the vulnerable. I would have quarantined the vulnerable, uh, certainly people who are elderly are most vulnerable. Others who have pre-existing conditions are going to be pretty vulnerable to this disease, just like they are to the flu, by the way, right? Uh, and uh, I would have done everything possible to try to work within you know, the law and within people's lives to protect the vulnerable. But you know, in a pandemic, you don't quarantine the healthy. And that's exactly what California did. Ron DeSantis, on the other hand, didn't do that to his credit. And let me tell you, Ron DeSantis and I are kind of cut from the same cloth. Uh, he was an outsider. I don't know if you remember this, but he beat an insider, Adam Putnam, in the primary, and then he beat another insider, the mayor of Tallahassee, uh, in the general election. I'm an outsider. I'm not a politician. I'm a businessman. I'm... I'm running outside the political establishment because it's got to be changed. And, uh, and that means the silent majority has to rise up. And that's why I, I, I love what you're doing here, Tim, because we have to take back our government. That's, that's all there is to it. Yeah, well, I, th I think we're all in agreement on that. Um, we, when we had you out here to the church, right. you know, that was... Um, you know, four services real fast, brought you out, gave you 10 minutes. Um, but we didn't get to ask you a lot of uh, the questions we wanted to ask, so we're sure. glad you're back tonight. Uh, one of those questions, and, and this is a, is a hard one to, to ask, but probably an easy one to answer. Um, and so the, the question is this, you ran before and you didn't win. So what makes Media you, likes to highlight that yeah, fact, too. Yeah. Uh, well, let's, let's let you answer the question of what makes you believe you're going to win this time. Well, if you remember, by the way, uh, I wasn't around then. I'm not sure any of you were either, but uh, Abraham Lincoln lost two Senate races before he won the presidency. I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> um, listen, uh, California is a nation state. I mean, it, it really is. 40 million people. I ran in 2018 because I knew how dangerous Gavin Newsom was going to be for the state of California. I saw what he did in San Francisco, and I stepped up to run. Not a lot of other people did, by the way, uh, given California's recent history, right? And uh, I surprised a whole lot of people. I ran a, a pretty good campaign. I, I made the top two. Everybody expected that to be two Democrats, if you remember, right? But, you know, listen, trying to get known in a state of 40 million people takes huge bucks and a lot of time, neither of which I had. So I did get 4.7 million votes, and, and that was very close to the number of votes that Arnold Schwarzenegger got when he won by, 2000, uh, by uh, 15 points in 2006. So... Frankly, you know, I got the second most votes of any Republican statewide candidate in history. Uh, so I got a lot of votes. Obviously, it was a huge turnout election because you had Tom Steyer and Michael Bloomberg and George Soros spending millions of dollars to 
harvest ballots and do other things in California in 2018. If you remember, it wasn't a great year for Republicans as it, as it was. Uh, but I got known by a good number of people, and they, and, and they got some comfort level with me. And that's where I start now. And so I'm starting with that base of people that, that probably knew something about me. And I'm hoping that during this recall election, they'll get to know more about my life and what I believe in and what I intend to do as governor and get that comfort level going and hopefully then, uh, you know, be the, the, the vote leader in this recall and we vote to recall Mr. Newsom and we, we get this state turned around and get it moving again. Fair enough. So... Um, I, I've watched people, you know, they, they run, uh, then the next time they run, they do things different because obviously we learn as we, as we go along. I mean, sure. strategies change, times change, so strategies change. Um, what would you say your campaign strategy this, this go around? What's your, what's your strategy going to be? What's your ground game going to look like? Well, you know, I have to be honest with you, you know, I am who I am. Uh, I'm not going to change who I am. Uh, I'm a believer. First and foremost, uh, I also believe in freedom and liberty, and everything I do as governor is going to be guided by preserving freedom and liberty. I want you to know that. Uh, so I'm not ever going to vary from that. Um, you know, in the campaign in 2018, frankly, I talked about the same issues that I'm going to talk about now. I'm going to talk about housing and homelessness and the tax burden and the education system. Uh, I'm going to talk about energy and water and protecting us from the fires and all, all the major, major issues that the current uh, leadership is failing on. It's really incredible how many areas they're failing in. Uh, you know, the only thing they do well is tax us. They, they really <laughs> do a good job of doing that, don't they? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they, they generate huge tax revenues. Uh, but... I'm also obviously going to be talking about the pandemic uh, because that's now a new thing. I mean, we now have uh, an unemployment rate that's, I think, over 9% now in California. Uh, it was only 3% in 2018, so jobs in the economy were always an important issue, but they weren't that important in 2018. Now they're even more important than they were then. Um, but I'm obviously going to be, you know, trying to get better known to the people. I mean, I think that's, you know, people aren't going to vote for somebody they don't know. That's all there is to it. And uh, I'm hoping that as we go along in this campaign, uh, we're going to have a big bus where uh, we're going to be traveling around the state and doing events uh, in a lot of places. And, and, and we're going to have to work hard, but we're going to get to know the voters even more and get people comfortable with what I plan to do. And... Uh, and talk about these the solutions to these issues that I've talked about. Um, so, um, ground game doesn't. So you're not going to make many changes. Or? Well, we're, we're certainly going to have a much bigger ground game. Uh, obviously, the fact that I ran before now people know me. They're more willing to come out and volunteer and and help in the campaign. Um, we're building coalitions, as you know. We did a lot of outreach to churches in 2018. We're going to multiply those efforts this time. Uh, there's a huge church population in California, I think, that is clearly unrepresented. I mean, you know, notice what, what Mr. Newsom did when we had the pandemic. Pot shops and strip clubs were essential. Those were allowed to stay open. Churches, they were shut down, except for this one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Give them a round of applause. <laughs> um. So, yeah, pot, pot shops, strip clubs, abortion clinics. Abortion clinics were allowed to stay um, open, absolutely. I'll, I'll, you've already stated it, but I'll let you restate your position on the, I'm, the, the I'm issue for, of life. I'm for protecting life uh, from uh, conception to, to natural death. I mean, uh, there's no more important issue, in my view, than life. Uh, you know, my, my mother was, was raped by my real father, and, and he left. Uh, he didn't support her. Uh, I think men and women need to take responsibility for life. That's all there is to it. Yeah. It's about responsibility. Yeah, um, you know, the, the idea that you just said that, that your mother was raped, uh, that, that is an issue that a lot of people say, well, you know, 
we can't do away with abortions because what about the woman who's been raped? Uh, and that question gets brought up a lot, but you know, there's a real strong biblical answer for that, and is you don't, you don't, you don't um, punish a child for the sins of their father. I'm not the one that did the rape. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, so, I, I deserve to live. Yeah. I mean, that's all there is to it. Yeah, and I mean, if, if you don't punish a child for the sins of the father, how do you give that child the harshest punishment we give in the land, which is the, the, death, the death penalty? Yeah. Why would you give a child the death penalty for something his or her Father Listen, did. We ought to be we ought to be talking about taking responsibility when I talk about adoption. I mean, there are a lot of families that would love to have children and can't for one reason or another. And uh, you know, babies can be put up for adoption. Right. I had an aunt that actually wanted to adopt me when <clears throat> when this all took place, and my mom, to her credit, said no. She wanted to keep me and and raise me, and I'm I'm glad she did. I love my mom, and she really had, did a halfway decent job. I don't. <laughs> um, you mentioned getting out to the Christians, uh, getting out to the yeah. churches. Um, it's an unfortunate thing, and I'm embarrassed as a pastor to say this, but Christians don't vote. Well, we've got to change that. We've got to change that. Um, we get what we deserve if we don't. Right. Well, we get what we have yes. when we don't. Yeah, uh, because the fact is, if all the evangelical Christians showed up and voted, we wouldn't. We would have had you and not Gavin Newsom. And let me That's tell you fact. this: this can be done. Texas, Texas was a democratic state. Do you remember Ann Richards, the one who said uh, that George W. Bush was, or George H. W. Bush was born with a silver foot in his mouth? Remember that one? Remember that 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 woman? Uh, she was as liberal as they can. They come. And she was the governor of Texas before George W. Bush in the, in the 90s. And the evangelical churches said enough of this. And they, they organized, and they got people to vote, and they informed people of the issues. And George W. Bush won that race. And then, of course, Rick Perry after that, and Greg Abbott now. And, and Texas has had a great record, right? No taxes, right? But it's also free uh, and uh, they've, they've had a, a good response to the pandemic here, and, you know, they're, they're getting a lot of people moving from California to Texas. And, uh, you know, don't, don't, don't leave right now. Stick around. Uh, but we can do that, too. We can do that, too. This state was reliably Republican for a long time, and, uh, you know, we kind of gave that up. Uh, I think it's now incumbent upon all of us to take a leadership position and, and, and do what we can to bring it back. Yeah. Well, part of that is going to be number one. We got to get the evangelicals to vote. That's yes. number one, and that's yes. going to be in, this can be the job of the pastors. The pastors yes. got to step up. They got to educate Absolutely. the congregation on the issues and the people. And then uh, we, we need to take advantage of uh, a very dirty term, uh, ballot harvesting. Uh, but we we did that here at our church. We ballot harvested or ballot collected, if you want to use a ballots, politically right? collect, uh, correct term. Right, um, right, right. But it's legal, and the radical left does it. So we have you to know, we have to be shrewd. God's called us to be shrewd, and we have to find a way to make it happen. Uh, right. But another issue then would be voter confidence. Right. You know, and and that's a, a big issue. And uh, my question to you would be: How can we increase voter? confidence because right. um, a lot of voter confidence went down the toilet in many ways. Well, first ways. of all, so, you know, as governor of this state, I would absolutely push for in-person elections. Yes. Uh, absentee balloting is fine if you re request it, if there's a reason you can't get to the ballot or get, get to the polling place. I actually liked voting at the polling places. You got to see your neighbors, you go in there and you sign, you know, the book and, you know, uh, I will tell you, by the way, this whole pandemic thing was an excuse because South Korea a year ago had a national election, 40 million people in South Korea, right? About the same size as California. And uh, they had a national election. And they did it entirely in person. They had masks. They protected people, hand sanitizer, whatever it was. But that was a year ago when the pandemic was pretty, you know, pretty raging, uh, especially in South Korea, and and they were able to do it without a major problem. And uh, so I think this is completely bogus mailing ballots all over the place that you don't know where they're going to end up or who's going to fill them out or what's going to happen with them. Now, 
we had this discussion at dinner, you know, for those who think that California's elections were rigged last year, I, I, I will take issue with that a little bit, and I'll tell you why. And this is what gives me hope, by the way, for this election coming up, because even though President Trump lost California, we all knew that was going to happen anyway, right? Uh, but despite that, there were all these initiatives on the ballot last November, if you remember, uh, a, a huge tax increase, $10 billion dollars. Uh, annual tax increase, $10 billion. Uh, there were all those restrictions on Uber and Lyft. Remember those? The freelance restrictions? Uh, those were on the ballot. Uh, rent control, cash bail, uh, affirmative action. All these initiatives that Newsom endorsed, and they all lost. And they weren't close. They weren't close. And that kind of tells me that people maybe are, are waking up, that maybe there's voters out there that really are getting it, that they really got to take the lead themselves and, and vote these things. And so I'm, I'm encouraged by that. I'm not resting on my laurels or anything. I'm not going to take it easy. I'm going to work hard, but I'm encouraged. And, and that also gives me some encouragement that the election was reasonably correct and not fraudulent in California. I don't know what happened in Atlanta, Philadelphia, Detroit, Milwaukee. You know, I mean, that's a different story. Uh, but, but here in California, I think the election was probably, there may have been some fraud, but it was probably not nearly enough that it would influence the election, or else they would have made sure that that tax increase passed, let me tell you. Well, re regardless, though, I mean, there there are lawsuits being filed against county registrar yes. voters. Yes, uh, I'm people aware of those. Do, they do know about those, and so it is having an adverse reaction on voter um, and, confidence. So, yeah. what do you think we can do to help increase voter confidence? And that's why, Tim, I am four square in favor of in person balloting. Absolutely should have voter ID. I mean, come yes. on. I mean, come you on. need. Yeah. Doesn't it make you wonder if the, the groups that don't want voter ID, what are they hiding here? What, what's right. the purpose of that? I mean, let's make sure that IDs are available to everybody. I mean, that's fine. I mean, let's make sure that everybody yeah. who is a, a legal voter has an ID. I mean, I'd even authorize spending some money to make sure that people go out and get visited if they have, you know, problems getting to a registrar of voters or something like that. Let's make sure everybody has a legitimate ID to vote. Uh, we want everybody to vote. Right. There's no question about that. When you think about ma Major League Baseball, you have to have a, an ID to go pick up tickets at will call. Totally. And they're saying it's racist if we want a voter, a, an ID to go vote for who's going to be the leader of the free world. Well, uh, That's what, racist, but you better have your ID to pick up your baseball tickets. What was it, the, the, Democratic, the Democratic National Convention, they had a meeting or something like that, and they required voter ID to get into that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is there a little bit of irony little, going little, on there? Yeah. And, you know? yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, enough said, enough said. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, we need, to, we need to find a way to increase voter confidence. Um, I'm hoping that, that along the next six seven months, we, we find a way to do that, because yes. I think that's going to be key. I think key. that's essential. Um, I think it's going to, we need to have people get involved with the county registrar of voters. Right. Right. They need to be there. They need to be active. They need to be involved. Um, let's face it, uh, a lot of times, people who are in opposition to us, they're the ones at, at these places. Right. So we need to find, you know, conservative people, people with a Judeo-Christian mindset, they've got to make their way there and be an active part of this. And um, it's kind of a joke, you know, that, that, that the Republicans aren't actively involved because they're at work. Um, <laughs> well, but I've the heard thing that. Is, yeah. But, you know, but the thing is, it's no excuse at this point. Um, we need to be engaged. We need to be involved. We need to be a part of the solution. And if we aren't a part of the solution, well, then we are, we are a pro part of the problem. Remember, remember something I've always lived by, and I hope you understand this too. Busy people get the most done. Isn't that true? If you want something done, give it to a busy person because they don't waste time, right. you know, and, and that's how I've lived my life. I've always been a busy person, but I always get a lot done because I, I make sure I use my time efficiently and right. well, and 
So I know we're all working, but we can, we can take some time to participate in the political process. We have to. And it's our responsibility. And you know what? One of my other favorite expressions is, we will be made to care. And, and, and right now, the one-party rule and the lobbyists in Sacramento are making us care because they're making our lives a lot more difficult than they need to be in this state. We can see that every single day. Every time you write out a check for your rent or your house payment or your tax payment or your energy bill, your electric bill, or you go to the gas pump and you see what you're paying versus your friends in Arizona or Texas, it's outrageous the cost of living, and it's all government. And you don't know this yet, but you're going to be required to ration your water pretty soon. Did you know that? Right. They, they've been keeping this pretty quiet, you know. And in, in 2022, Brown signed this on the way out of office, his last gift to us. But we're going to be limited to 55 gallons a day. And, and if you don't know... A typical shower can be maybe 20 to 30 gallons. A wash of clothes could be another 30 gallons or something like that. Pretty soon you're going to have to decide if you can want to take a shower or wash your clothes in the same day. All the while, we're sitting next to the largest body of water in the entire world. This is incomprehensible to me. And we get an incredible snow melt every single year, most of which flows into the Pacific Ocean. Right. Well, you know what? We can protect fish. I like fishing. I have a lot of friends that fish. We can protect fish and we can have water. Don't believe these politicians who tell you we can't. We can. Yeah, absolutely we can. Um, I shared the stage a few times with a man named Brandon Straka. Yes. Started the, the hashtag walk away walk movement. Away. Yeah. Um, he, he doesn't necessarily get people to go to the Republican Party, but his whole thing is just walk away from being a Democrat. And he gained a lot of traction over the last few years. And, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of people I've talked to who never thought they would have walked away from the Democrat Party. But um, you're a person who's done that. I did. So I, I started out a Democrat. Yeah. So. Um, why? Because my yeah. mom was a Democrat. Okay. So, yeah, tell us, tell us why you were a Democrat, and tell us um, kind of how you made that journey away from that group. You know, my mom was a Democrat. Actually, she was a liberal Democrat, and we, we actually had a lot of spirited discussions, I'll call them, as I got to be an adult. Um, I actually ran for delegate to the Democratic Convention in 1976. Uh, I was trying to defeat... Richard Daly, who was the mayor of Chicago. I grew up in Chicago. And, and yet you need to understand my history. I abhor corruption. I mean, I think corruption is just the absolute worst thing. And why? Because it, it, it erodes people's lives. It, it causes a lack of trust. It erodes confidence in government. And it makes our lives a lot more difficult than it needs to be. When we have political corruption... Things don't work as well as they should, and things end up costing a lot more than they should because somebody's making money from it. So to me, that's one of the biggest things that, that I think differentiates the two parties. Now, I tell you what, I've seen some Republican corruption too, and you may have seen an ad that I ran here recently about one of my opponents in the gubernatorial race here who... I think did a very corrupt transaction while he was the mayor of a major city in the state. In the state, I'm going to call out corruption in both parties. It has absolutely no place in our political process. I hope you appreciate that. Yes. But I be, I became a Republican because I became a CPA. I. Uh, I, I was I passed the CPA exam when I was 20 years old. Uh, I finished college. I always like to say I finished college in two and a half years because I was paying for it. <laughs> My daughters took five years because I was paying for it. Uh, but uh, I, I became a CPA when I was 20 years old, and I started doing tax returns for people who were paying taxes at 70%. Wow. Uh, many of you don't remember that, but that was what the tax rate was when Jimmy Carter was in office. And think about that for a second. If you made an investment 
you only got to keep 30% of your profit. 70% went to the government. So guess what? You, you aren't going to take much risk with an investment, are you? Because even if you make a profit, you're only going to get to keep 30%. What's the point, right? Ronald Reagan brought me to the Republican Party along with Jack Kemp because he said these tax rates are too high. It's stifling investment. We need investment. Without investment, you don't get innovation. You don't get growth. You don't get new innovations and a better standard of living. I mean, that hopefully is obvious to most of us, right? And so Ronald Reagan worked out a deal with uh, the Democrats, and he dropped the top rate down to 28% in 1986, if you remember that. And we're living with the benefits of that today. You know, your cell phone, your computer, your, the medical devices we have, the, the great life-saving you know, treatments that we have are all the result of investments, and a lot of those investments were made because the tax rates were reduced. And that's what brought me to the Republican Party. It was just common sense. If you reduce the tax rates and give people a chance to keep more of their profits, they'll make more investment. And we want more investment so that we get better things in, in life. And my God, we've, we've undergone a revolution in technology because of this, I think. And I, I hope it means that our lives are better. I think they are. And uh, although I don't think so sometimes when my 16-year-old's on our screen, uh, but, uh, you know, a lot of these things have made our lives more efficient and better, and that's, that's, that's attributable to that, that change in the tax law. No, I remember in the 80s people making fun of Ronald Reagan because of the Star Wars yeah. program, but we yeah. look at uh, a lot of the technology we have today as a result of that Star Wars program. Um, well, shameless plug, uh, there's a movie coming out in December. It's going to be released at Christmas, and Dennis Quaid is playing Ronald Reagan. And I think this is going to be a great movie. I hope it is because I invested in it. And, uh, and I think it's a story that needs to be told. It's about Ronald Reagan's lifelong battle against communism. And you know what? Ronald Reagan changed the world. And remember, he was governor of California. He was an outsider like me. And by the way, a lot of people said he was too conservative to be governor and president. Remember that? They said, oh, he's too conservative. He's too conservative. And he became one of our most popular presidents, and he changed the world. Much of Eastern Europe is free because of Ronald Reagan and, and the way he stood up to communism. And if you think about communism, one of the big things in, in the communist world is to, is to kill the churches. Right. Because the government is, is the deity in, right. in communism, right? And they don't want any competition. And so they're going to, they're gonna, you know... They're going to shut down the churches, and right. and Mr. And they Newsom. Start with the young people. Yeah, exactly. So this this movie's coming out in December, and I think it's going to be great. So I urge you all to see it. I I play Justice uh, Warren Berger. The uh, uh, so I'm in the movie. Uh, it, it was kind of fun to do this, uh, but uh, you know, having white hair actually helped. Uh, <laughs> so, what if there's a role for somebody with no hair? I don't know. Justice Berger had white hair. So, you know, they could put a wig on you. Yeah. Um, we had a, a question uh, from somebody that's here tonight. Uh, they want to know, mm -hmm. if, you, if you win, what are the first three things you're going to do to undo what Gavin Newsom has done? Well, I'm going to go right at the major issues that are making life tough here. So the first one is housing. Uh, we have got to bring down the cost of building in this state. Uh, I am in the building business. Uh, I started out as a CPA, but I got into building and managing apartments in, in the Midwest primarily. And I can build wonderful apartments in Indiana for a fraction of what they cost here, and most of the difference is government. It's really government. And, and that ends up in the cost of everything. It's in the cost of your health care. It's in the cost of your food. It's in the cost of your clothing. And why? Because housing is the largest single cost in any household budget. So salaries in California have to be a lot higher in order to be able to afford the housing cost. And because those salaries are higher, the person that serves you at the restaurant has to get paid more. Therefore, 
that cost goes into the cost of the food that you buy and the cost of the, the nurse and the health care and, and everything. It's all throughout the economy in the state, which is one of the things that drives up the cost uh, for everybody. It's also in the cost of government, by the way, right? Our government is, is basically labor, isn't it? The prison guards to the home health care workers to the nurses to the bureaucrats, a lot of whom are going to have to look for work after I'm the governor. Uh, we're going to make things a lot more efficient in this state if I have anything to say about it. Uh, but we'll have a growing economy, so they'll have plenty of jobs. Uh, but the cost of labor in the government goes up and up and up, right, with the same housing costs. So that's why our taxes keep going up and up. Um, so let me just ask this. So what has Gavin Newsom done oh, he's made that, costs that you would higher. undo oh, he's, to he, he, help he, with the housing? He's added to the mandates. There's, there's, there's so many mandates and so many regulations. It takes 12 years to get a housing project approved in the state. There's five levels of approvals you have to go through. There's, there's lawsuits. There, there, there's, they're basically extortionary lawsuits that have to get, you know, uh, settled or defended uh, in any housing project. And it just drives the cost out of sight. Uh, you know, other states manage to build housing in a lot quicker time without all the lawsuits and without all the problems. And they care about the environment. You know, it's not about the environment. It's about the bureaucrats and the lawyers and the special interests. That's the ones that are driving up this cost. Um, the other well, thing... they got to pay for th dinner at the French Laundry. Well, they, that's exactly yeah. right. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's expensive, the wine yeah, especially. Right. Uh, the other thing is homelessness. I mean, I'm, I don't know about you, but I am personally just horrified by the homelessness in this state and the, and, and the frank uh, impotency of the public officials to deal with it. You know, we don't pay what we pay to live in California only to have somebody just pitch a tent uh, on the sidewalk or on the beach. You know, that just isn't, that just isn't right. And it's not fair, and it's not fair to them. If, if they're addicted or they're mentally ill, they need to get treatment. So my answer is treatment first, not housing first. Politicians have just gone off and bought hotels and think that they're going to get the job done. I mean, that's a waste of tax dollars as far as I'm concerned. So homelessness is, 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 is the second issue. And the third issue, frankly, is education. Because i got to tell you, uh, we have got to educate our children better. First of all, we're incarcerating all of our mistakes in the education system, right? I mean, if, if kids graduate high school and they can't read their diploma, what are they going to do? They're, they're not going to be able to work in the economy. They're going to go in a life of crime. And so it, it makes all of us less safe. But we also have to make sure our children have a chance, and, and, and especially the least among us. I mean, it's horrifying to me in this pandemic. I just read that 40%, 40% of the children in the Los Angeles public school system have literally been lost. They don't know where they are. They haven't checked in. Think about that. For the last year, over the last year, uh, and these are most of these kids are kids of color, minorities. What's going to happen to them? They're falling further and further behind. And guess what? That's more burden on us. It's more crime. It's it's not good for the future of the state. So education is, and we spend a huge amount on education. Let me tell you, when I'm the governor of this state, we're going to get done school choice for parents. Amen. Competition. A competition makes my business better. It makes your business better. Monopolies never, ever do a good job, and especially one run by politicians. Right. Power. Listen, this pandemic's been a gift, the, the, the response that Newsom has done here, because it's shown the parents of this state who have the real who has the real power in our school systems right now the union the union bosses mm -hmm. it's not the teachers even it's the union bosses mm -hmm. they're the ones that pull the strings the parents don't have the power and the parents are plenty upset i think it's the moms especially who who really got this going yeah so what what about education has gavin done that you would undo well, first of all, he's killed competition. I mean, his first act in office was to make it more difficult to operate charter schools. 
and, and put vast new requirements in and that, that basically ran a whole bunch of them out of business. Uh, I think we ought to have way more charter schools. Again, we will if the parents have vouchers, vouchers, tax credits, scholarships. I don't know if you saw the article in the Wall Street Journal the other day, 25 states now have some kind of tax credit or scholarship program. And it's demonstrably making their schools better. It is, there's documented studies now that show the reading scores improve, the math scores improve, the science scores improve. And let me tell you, we're not going to teach ethnic studies or critical race theory. We're going to teach reading, writing, and arithmetic. Yeah, those things uh, that you just mentioned being introduced into our public school system, this is cultural Marxism. Well, that's what that it's is. It's political indoctrination. Right. It's yeah, political so what, indoctrination. What, what, that's what they're being used for. Yes. What happens is you do this at an early age and you, you break down the family unit. When you break down the right. family unit, people don't know who they can depend on, so who do they depend on? They depend right. on the government. And that's what pushes people to communism. This is what we're watching play out right in front of us. Um, and there's and nothing... the schools are, are r the first step. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. You've yep. got to go for the yep. young ones. Yep. Uh, which is why, and we're, we're seeing right now um, a, a push in the state of California as we go back to school. Right. Um, what we're being told now uh, by um, this administration is that because over the last year we've lost so much time, the kids have... Uh, you know, their education for the last year has been very, very poor. And so to make up for that, we're going to need to see longer hours in the classroom. We're going to need to see um, mandatory summer school programs. We need to, they're, what they're saying is they're going to capitalize. The radical left is going to capitalize on these children having been gone for a year to say we need them more time now which, of course, is more time for them to indoctrinate our children. Yeah, no, I, you know? I, I agree with that. Um, and, and, and that's what happens when you put politicians in charge of the schools. Let's, let's get the parents in charge of the schools. Let's get the parents the control that we need. Yeah, and I, can, I agree with you 100% on that. We cannot do it through the PTA, in case you're wondering. Uh, the PTA is just an arm of the CTA. Um, you, you raise your money. People get so involved raising money for the PTA. The PTA just does whatever the CTA says, and the CTA is the most corrupt union in the entire state. So um, we're, we're in an uphill battle, that's no for question. sure. No um, question. And this is a, a difficult time for our nation. Um, so housing, you would, you would... Housing, homelessness, education, those are the three biggest issues. And I'll tell you what, the minute I get elected, by the way, if Newsom gets recalled, I love this fact, he's got 10 days to clean out his office. Yeah, 10 days. And, and on the 11th day, uh, I introduce a set of proposals in the legislature to fix housing and cut the processes and cut the cost of building in California. That's what's got to happen. All the zoning things, they're trying to eliminate single-family zoning. They're trying to you know, force you know, state-mandated things. No, no. Cut the cost of building. That will get a lot more housing. There will be a lot more builders that will come in and build when we cut the costs. Now, there's other things we have to do, too. We've got we've to in introduce industrial arts back into education, too. You know, we're not, we're not teaching kids to be plumbers and carpenters and electricians anymore. We, you know, not every kid can go to college or should go to college. So we've got to, you know, those are wonderful professions. We don't even have enough of those to, to build, you know, the houses. And another thing is we've got to revive the lumber industry in California. I mean, this is one of the problems with the fires. The fires, right. We have run the sawmills out of business in California. We used to have 100, back in the 70s, we had 100 really prosperous functioning sawmills in, in California. And guess what? They took care of the forests. They built roads. They built fire breaks. They planted they, because that's their business. That, that's their future inventory. They, they replanted after they cut. They didn't just clear cut all the forests. No, they, they, they took care of the forests. Well, guess what? The environmentalists ran them all out of California. There's only maybe five left. And we're importing most of our lumber now from Canada. A lot of it went to Canada. 
And I don't know if you've seen lumber prices lately. If, if, if you've, I'm in the building business. Lumber prices have tripled in the last uh, six months. And a lot of it is because we're importing. We don't have a domestic lumber industry. And, and again, that's one of the reasons we have a fire problem that we have in the state. Yeah, it's a massive fire problem. It really is. Um, and, it, and it's not because of Donald Trump, no. uh, <laughs> which no. was one of the things they were trying to say. It's because of uh, what we've done with the environmentalists, uh, having so much control in our state. Um, we, we only have time for one more question, and uh, to me it's an it's a important one, seeing as the day and age we live in. Yep. Um, I have a lot to say about vaccinations. I have a lot to say about yep. the M mRNA, which is not a vaccination, um, just so you know. So... Um, I'm actually going to talk about that at church, not this Sunday, but the following Sunday. So I don't want to get so much into vaccines, good or bad. What I, um, and I know you've, you've received a vaccination, uh, but my right. question to you would be, would you allow for medical freedom for people to choose whether or not they want the Absolutely. vaccination? And what do you say about these vaccine passports? Listen, I, as you mentioned, I have been vaccinated. I decided to do it. I looked at the literature. I read everything, and I felt that it was reasonable. Uh, but I don't care if I sit next to somebody who's unvaccinated. I'm vaccinated. I, I, I can't get it from them, and I can't give it to them. And so uh, it, it, it shouldn't matter. I mean, that's the whole point of getting the vaccination or having the vaccine available. If you don't want it, you shouldn't have to take it. That's freedom. Yeah. You're, you're perfectly able to take that risk. You're an adult. You're perfectly able to take that risk. And uh, so I, I tell you what, I think it's very dangerous, this whole thing. I mean, now we're getting sports leagues that are getting involved in this, and it's all tied up in politics and control. I, I think that's what it is, isn't it? It's control. And this, this whole pandemic response all the way along, listen, I fully agreed with two weeks to s slow the spread early on. Two weeks, not a year. Uh, this has just gone on way too long, and it's disrupted too much of our lives, and it's, it's crushed our spirit and crushed our freedom. And, and I think it's the reason, one of the main reasons Mr. Newsom is, is going to be out at the end of this year, and we're going to have a new governor. So, um, in regards to the vaccine passports, I'm against these... it completely. I mean, again, it's it's. Okay. I'm going to be governed by freedom and liberty, and to me, making people give an ID like that is is not freedom. That's a that's a scarlet letter. That's that's harkening back to, you know, other times that were not uh, so good, uh, you know, in the world. Uh, freedom and liberty. That's what this country has always stood for. And a, a vaccine passport is, is, does not comport with freedom and liberty as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, it's an unfortunate thing because um, we had the White House, Jen Psaki, uh, came out and said that uh, the federal government is not going to mandate a, a passport. We'll see if they make good on that statement. Um, and, and we'll, you know, my, my guess is that at some point we are going to see the federal government well, require you know, it. But, but, I, but I worry that they're going to do this in the back door. Because they're going to say you can't go to a sports stadium, you can't go to college. Have you seen? Yeah, Duke some University of the colleges just came out this are week saying with that. You're, you're not going to be allowed on campus if you're not vaccinated. Well, again, if the vaccine's available to f for you, if you want to get vaccinated, get vaccinated. If you don't want to get vaccinated, don't get vaccinated. But if you're vaccinated, you can't give it to somebody, and you can't get it from somebody. So you should be able to sit next to somebody who's unvaccinated and not worry about it. You don't. You don't need than to worry that you, who you're sitting next to on an airplane or in a classroom. Yeah. Well, you know, you look at, um, we, like we talked about at dinner, we live in Riverside County. Riverside County has uh, an incredible sheriff, Chad Bianco. We have an incredible district attorney, Mike Hestron. Yeah. Both of them said we're not going to enforce these draconian measures. Right. Um, but uh, all of a sudden we still see people social distance masked up. Why? Not because they're afraid of what the sheriff or the DA might do, but because... The corporations, yeah, they're all forcing it. So, yeah. um, you know, the the thing is, you're you're saying you're a hundred percent against the vaccine passports, um, and you may never, you know, you you as governor wouldn't sign legislate, you wouldn't sign it into law that those are required. Absolutely but, not. But the corporations are the ones that are making it a reality. Well, um, I'll have the bully pulpit. Yeah, it's called leadership, and and rest assured, I. 
I'm, I'm not doing this for kicks and giggles. You know, uh, I'm doing this to make a difference in this country. And, and believe me, I'm not going to stay silent. If I see something like that, that that impinges on our freedoms and our liberties, I'm going to speak up about it. Amen. Rest assured. Amen. All right. Well, we are out of time, uh, but uh, John Cox, very happy to have you out tonight. Thank you for Thank you. coming out. And um, Thank you all for being here. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. We do have Katie Hopkins next week. She's a riot. She's, she's so a much, pistol. She I've is. seen her. Yeah. yeah. She's a British girl. British woman. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I've seen her. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you're not going to want to miss that. Invite no. a friend. Invite a family Don't member. Don't miss that. Don't yeah. miss that. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm, John, I'm boring. She's exciting. I'm, I'm boring. <laughs> well, um, you, you. Well, I'm not. You're not boring. Are I'm you? not. Are you? I'm. I'm trying to be self-deprecating. <laughs> Um, Failing miserably, but that's another story. <laughs> well, here, here's the thing. John is going to be hanging out for a, for a little bit. If you guys want to meet him, if you have questions you want to ask him personally or just get your picture with him, uh, feel free to do that. But, John, thank you again for coming out. Thank really, you, Tim. Really appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank you. And we will see you guys you next all. week. Uh, and to everybody watching online, thank you for joining us for our watch. Nice to be with you. Thank you.